I don't know, I feel compelled to somehow comment on this whole GameStop thing in all my classes, but, uh, well, yeah, I mean, that's a little bit more of a finance thing. Uh, I'm sure some of you are taking finance courses, so perhaps that's best left to their domain. Um, but we will be talking about finance later on in the course, probably, because uh, it's sort of inextricably linked to, to things like innovation and, and entrepreneurship. Um, in particular, this this concept of, of you know financing particular new ideas and stuff like that. So, I mean, I usually think about <clears throat> I usually think about if we're thinking if we're doing finance in an innovation and growth perspective, it's probably a little bit more relevant to 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 look at venture capital and things like that, where you have kind of looking at startups um, and stuff like that, because that's generally where the newest ideas come from. Uh, whereas the stock market might be a little bit more kind of established, but of course it's established firms that that are on the stock market because you you only really go public once you you know reach a certain level of success uh, in that sense. So so the the stock market maybe is a little bit more sort of you know GameStop or Walmart or stuff like that going from you know ten thousand stores to eleven thousand stores by raising capital in the, in that manner. Okay, but we will be talking about sort of smaller scale financial things. Um, because you know that you know one of the big problems with with entrepreneurship and financing is that it's not obvious what what ideas are good and what ideas are bad or at least not as good, right? So if you have a, if you think you have a brilliant idea, which I'm sure many of you do, and you want to start a company around it, you know at the very least to to get working capital to say pay your employees. Um, to develop things, you know, you, you probably need to go out and get some money from someone. Um, but you know, it's, since it's not clear which ideas are good and which are bad, you you know, that sort of necessitates a type of person like a venture capitalist who's, in theory at least, good at discerning the good ideas from the bad ideas, and then being somewhat selective about uh, about what they fund and what they don't fund. Okay, so that's for us a lot of sort of the financial stuff is going to come down to that, and uh, and the the sort of the core issue is is just what we would call information frictions okay uh wherein you know people disagree or don't have full information about the quality of certain ideas okay um so in a perfect world of course you would just sort of know and it would be common knowledge and you could give money to the best ideas to de to be developed uh but but in the the imperfect world that's what we call these financial frictions where it's sort of like it's hard to convey why you think an idea is good or it's hard to prove that uh, or to convince someone um, and stuff like that. Okay, so um, yeah, and on top of that, even if it wasn't, you might have people that are sort of more malicious, and they're, and they're just they they have ideas they know aren't good, but they slap some buzzwords on it and say this is AI now instead of just like a spreadsheet, uh, even though if it's a spreadsheet, um, and and you know try and get money out of that. Okay, so so there's also the the concept of sort of incentives and potential manipulation. Okay, so. Um, Yes, yeah, so we'll talk about that. That's going to be more, that's more micro level, naturally. Uh, it has macro implications, uh, but it's a more micro level phenomenon. Okay, but over the course of the term, we're going to probably, I mean, we're certainly going to be kind of looking at a more micro level. So we're going to start at the highest levels, the macro levels, especially today, uh, and then slowly we're going to get more, more detailed and more micro level as time goes on. Okay, and at the end, we're going to be looking at very specific uh, instances. Okay, so um, yeah, so so uh, we'll we'll get there eventually. Um, yeah. All right. So, but today we are going to be kind of at the macro level. This is a macro course, I guess, so that makes sense. Um, and in particular, we're gonna we're gonna be looking into more detail on on what's called the solo model, moving off from this somewhat depressing Malthusian world that we uh, that we had been occupying uh, thus far. Okay, so um, we'll do that. Though uh, we also have a problem set, so I post. I post. I ended up getting it posted last night. Uh, so here you can see on the on the website, also on on Canvas, um, we have it too. I, I know the last class at the end, Helenia, and I know you asked a question. I, I kind of missed until everyone had left. You know about where it's going to be available. So in general, I'm going to try and make everything, especially the problem sets and the lectures, available on both. Uh, the, the external course website, this one here, and also on Canvas, okay? Um, Canvas is a little awkward because it's like this embedded PDF, but you can you can open it in a new window too. So um, 
yeah, so that, so that for the lectures and, and problem sets, certainly that'll be the case. Okay, uh, for the for the videos of the lectures, um, those are gonna I, there's like a 500 megabyte limit on Canvas. I can't really do it there, but so I'm gonna it, I'm I'm uploading on YouTube and I'm gonna kind of somehow link that into Canvas. I might make a well, I have a playlist on YouTube, so they're all just going to be there in order, basically. But um, I'll link to that on Canvas as well. Okay, but um, you can also see up here. Uh, there's a, a YouTube link which should go to the right to my channel at least. Okay, and then I'll have a Econ seventy Econ seven twenty uh, seventeen twenty playlist. Okay, um, but about that homework. Um, so let's just take a peek at it. So there's two, there's basically two problems. Okay, here. Uh, both are on Malthus. Okay, and this is going to be due uh, the 9th today, yeah, on, on February 9th, okay, um, which is not this Tuesday, but the one after that, okay. So there's two problems. The first one is it's pretty similar to some of the stuff that I was doing in the lecture, okay. If you recall, I have I had that sort of more complex demographic function that, that was, you know, sort of went up for a, way, for a time and then went down and sort of leveled out. This one's kind of like that, except it's just the sort of modern part. It's just the part where if you actually, you know, you, you have less population growth if you have more income rather than both at once. It's just that, that second part, okay? And this is sort of like looking at what the outcome is. So, so the, the logic ends up being similar, okay? How you sort of draw that graph and figure out is technological growth outpacing the effects of population growth or are you kind of reverting back to this Malthusian world, okay? Um, same sort of logic is going to apply there, okay? So just 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 a specific sort of analytic form for that, which is just a, just a decreasing function, okay? Um, <clears throat> so that yeah, and then sort of figuring, okay, well, what um, is this reasonable? Okay, does the model seem to break down in the limit and stuff like that? Okay, and and particularly for the last uh, for the last point, okay. Um, that's that's what we're looking at, you know, whether this model is, is realistic, even as, as you take it to its extreme implications. Okay, um, so there I'm asking you, if you look basically this part D here, uh, find expression for the marginal products of land and labor. So so the idea here is, um, you know, if which is not model, but, but the idea here is, you know, if you have any particular outcome. Okay, so remember this is our production function here. If you have any particular outcome, okay, you can calculate the marginal products of these things, right? So, um, if, if we pop over to to the um, the iPad here, okay, so this is this was our production function, okay, All right, and so you can calculate these the marginal products with this production function. Just you know, basically, you're just taking the derivative essentially, okay? So you're saying, okay, well, what's the, the derivative with respect to k, for instance, okay? And so in this case, you know, that would be like z alpha times k to the alpha minus one times l to the one minus alpha, okay? So it's just we've taken that, that, that marginal um, partial derivative, I guess, um, and, uh, and, then, and then you, you know, we know that sort of, okay, so z is growing over time Okay, we know that L is growing over time. So figuring out what's going on with this whole, whole thing overall in, in a particular outcome, okay? And uh, and that's that's useful. Okay, so first of all, sort of calculating that, okay, using the growth rate stuff that we discussed, those rules of growth rates, you can apply the same logic here to look at this object, the, the marginal product of capital, okay? So this is saying how much additional capital, or sorry, how much additional output uh, are you getting if you have a little bit more, Sorry, I'm saying capital. If you have a little bit more land, which is K, okay, so you have a little bit more land, how much output is that going to produce? Okay, so the question is, um, are we in a setting where the, the incentives to get new land is just becoming immense? Okay, and people will do anything to, to find, you know, a new, even like a desert island somewhere to live. Okay, so um, that would indicate potentially a breakdown in the assumptions of the model as things get extreme. Okay, so you want to check on that. And, and um, I'm calling, I, I said that this is going to be the interest rate, so in general, we often think of the interest rate as being closely tied down by the marginal product of capital, okay, right? Because uh, the interest rate, the interest rate is kind of so, so. Here we're kind of mixing notions of financial and physical capital, but the interest rate, you know, it, 
through sort of banks and, and financial institutions as the intermediary is often you know representative of something like the you know how much you expect to produce if you can get a little bit more capital either you know financial and hence physical okay so um, and then if you think about analogously you can talk about the wage okay um, I think I asked for, yeah I should, you can think about the wage well that that you know that makes sense so that's sort of like the marginal product of labor okay so we've seen that in theories theories of labor in a competitive labor market you would expect the wage to be the margin equal to the marginal product of labor okay otherwise you could hire someone and, and produce more and make money on that or you would want to hire fewer people and stuff like that so a competitive market you would expect these to be at least related if not equal in a perfectly competitive market okay so um, so that's the idea. I wanted you to look at those things and figure out, okay, is it the case that people would really, really want to find new land? Or is it the case that, you know, the marginal price of labor is kind of out of whack in some way uh, relative to output? Okay, so that's that's what I'm asking you to look for there. Okay. Um, and if, if you need help with that, you know, if you have more questions, then we can, we can certainly talk about that, uh, you know, next week too. Okay. Um, all right, so that's question one. Um, question two adds another ele kind of element to this, okay? So, uh, and it, it's more or less building on top of, of what we did in class and also kind of what we'd see in, like, in, in problem one, okay? So problem two is, you know, the basic Malthusian model that we've been, that, that we've been using so far, okay, has... I mean, essentially it has sort of like some notion of output, okay, or output per person, which leads to population growth, let's just call it population for now, okay? And then that population growth also then goes on in the future to affect output, okay? And then also in the, it's kind of lurking in the background, we had this technology parameter Z, that was growing over time, right? So technology was growing and population is growing and, and we were looking at the sort of the net effect on output, okay? To try and figure out this, these outcomes, okay? So that's the basic, that's the core Malthusian dynamic that we, we have been looking at, okay? And what question two does is it adds another arrow here basically and says, okay, well, what if also population influenced the pace of technological growth, okay? So, and the, and, and the way I have it here, uh, um, jump back to uh, the problem itself. The way I, ha the way I have it is say, okay, the, that rate of, the derivative of Z, the rate of change of Z is directly proportional to population. Okay, so you can think about it as there's just a bunch of people out there and they just sort of come up with new ideas over time at some, at some rate, okay? So each, or each person does. So maybe it's that they're actually like working in the field and they're like, oh, if I, you know, use this plow in this way or whatever, then it, it works better. And, and that's an innovation, say, okay. Or maybe it's that they're some person sitting in their study, thinking about stuff or doing experiments or something like that. Uh, but they're coming up with new ideas sort of randomly over time. But the more people you have, the more ideas you're going to generate, okay. And, and because ideas are not um, excludable, I guess, you know, it's like, any, you know, if, if I come up or if you come up with a new idea, that can spread and everyone can use a new idea. It's not like a tool that only one can, person can use at a time. Okay, so because they're not excludable, they, and you know, if we have this uh, spread of knowledge, you might expect the rate of new ideas to be proportional to population. Okay, so that would be kind of a scale effect. So that's that. That's this additional arrow here. Okay, um, going from population to technology. So that's going to add a new dynamic. Okay, um, so instead of technology growing exogenously, now it's growing endogenously with population, and, and we can see what the outcome is there. Okay, so that that actually does change things. Okay, and it, probably for the better, I would think, um, and uh, sort of induces a different outcome. And so, so that's that's what I want to want you to look at there. Okay, and at the end, I ask a similar question to to what I did in in the first problem of thinking about. Okay, well now think about what's the marginal benefit of coming up with some new technology. Okay, so now we're saying what's what's the value basically of del y, del z? Well, that, that one's actually a little bit more straightforward. So what's that um, value, okay? And that's gonna give you some idea of like, kind of what, it, what is people's incentive uh, 
to generate new tech, new ideas and technology. Okay, um, do, is it plausible to think that people would actually have an incentive to keep thinking up up new things? Okay, because it's not always the case that you just randomly uh, come up with new ideas. Oftentimes, it requires effort and careful thought and giving up on you know your day job or something like that. So. Um, you know, it's, it's often a costly endeavor too. So, so you might want to think about the incentives there. Okay. All right. So those are the two, those are the two problems, um, that we're looking at, uh, uh, for the homework. That's, and so that's due next Tuesday. All right. Um, okay. And then some other stuff, office hours. Okay. So I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to try to do office hours. Tuesday, four to six. Okay, um, so basically after lecture on Tuesdays. Okay, um, yeah. I mean, if 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 those if if that doesn't work for a lot of people, then then I can certainly change it. Okay, but I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of provisionally try for that one. Um, and uh, yeah, if you I mean, but if you have class during that or whatever, if it doesn't work for you, then in general you can just email me. Um, and we can set up another time uh, to talk. Okay, so. Um, yeah, but so so that's here on the syllabus. I think that else I believe updated Canvas. Although I'll double check. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's it for sort of introductory stuff. Okay. So if there are no other questions about that. I'm going to hop into lecture. Okay. I had a question. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. For the problem sets, would you like us to uh, like handwrite and scan, or do it online? And like, did you want us to graph using Excel or other platforms? Yeah, um, you know, it's up to you. I mean, if, if it's, I guess my inclination would be kind of just handwrite and scan it. Um, if, but if you, if you want to plot stuff in Excel or whatever, as like a, you know, as like a, if, if, if you prefer to draw it, that, that's totally cool. That's probably what I would do. But if you want to plot it on a computer, that works uh, as well. Okay. Um, that work. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I imagine you guys have, Good amount of experience with that this but you know like so i'm probably being overly explanatory here but you know definitely use those apps dedicated to scanning documents and not, not just the camera but um uh that way everything's like aligned and the contrast is set up okay so um yeah and then on, and the the submission though is not canvas basically there's the the form on canvas okay uh all right okay so let's jump into lecture um so we've done, I mean, thus far we've done historical growth. Okay, that's Malthus. Um, now we're going to do modern growth, all right, which is, uh, which is solo. Okay, and um, so I'm going to, I'm going to shoot, switch over to the, uh, just handwriting in a second. But, you know, basically, again, as, as usual, everything I'm doing here um, is reflected uh, in the slides. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with solo, kind of going through the solo model, and then we'll talk about some of this stuff with kind of growth growth accounting um, and and so on. Okay, so but I think yeah. So I, I, I'm I'm just gonna switch right over to the handwritten notes. Okay, all right. So so last and so last time, remember I kind of drew this funky diagram here with a bunch of arrows flying around. Um. Yeah, I mean. Let's okay. So, but but essentially, the idea is we're 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 sticking with this production function, basically, the Cobb Douglas production function. Okay, uh, we're renaming land to capital and generalizing that that notion. Okay, um, but but still using the, the letter K, which now makes more sense. It's like das Kapital, you know, it's spelled with a K in German. That's basically why we use K for capital. Okay, so um, yeah, so we have this capital and labor, which combine to produce output, and then, you know, you divert some output into investment, divert the rest into consumption, and then just kind of iterate your economy along, okay? And in the background, again, tech technology is sort of feeding into that, okay? Um, that's the basic idea, okay? So let's, let's try and make that a reality, okay? So this is a solo model. Okay, I don't know, maybe perhaps some of you have seen it. Perhaps some of you haven't. Okay, uh, yeah, this guy Robert Solo kind of came up with this um, sort of a, I mean, a very simple model, really. Um, and there's, there's not actually any decisions being made by agents. It's very mechanical. Okay, but sort of the simplest possible model that 
at least generates some interesting dynamics and, a little, and something like a trade-off um, of some sort. Okay, so uh, yeah, and this was I think it's still so a it came around about 1956 or 60 or something like that. So it's pretty old too. Okay, um, and yeah, so let's let's think about the, the as with Malthus. Okay, we can go through this uh, sort of start out with the assumptions. Okay, make sure we're clear on what the assumptions are, and then and then go go on towards the implications. Okay, so uh, assumptions. Okay, so <clears throat> production same as before. All right, we're gonna have that production function y equals z k to the alpha l to the one minus alpha. Okay, so that's still there. And uh, investment, that's new. Okay, so investment um, is gonna be the just sort of the simplest possible investment rule you can imagine, okay? Which is basically we're going to invest some fraction s of output. Okay, so every day, every every year, quarter, you get you get some amount of output. You divert <clears throat> this fraction s to investment. Okay, uh, and then the rest you you di divert you use for consumption. Okay, so s goes to investment. One minus s goes to consumption. You know those two have to add to one, so that's why you're using s and one minus s. Okay, so. We're, u we're using S because, I mean, S, you know, sort of the first thing you might think is like savings rate or something like that. So it's a, it's a percentage uh, savings. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's really investment, okay? But we didn't want to write capital I because it can get confused with like imaginary numbers and we don't, we don't really have any imaginary numbers, usually in economics. So um, we use S, okay? So that's, that's the sort of saving, hence investment rate. Um, and that's what goes into to new capital. Okay, and so in this case, well, so that's investment. Okay, the question is how does capital actually change? Right, with capital, the net change in capital is actually the result of two forces. One is is a positive force, which is that investment. Okay, and the other is a negative force, which is what we call depreciation. Okay, so here, <clears throat> um, right. So so the rate of change of capital. Okay, so this is like with solar, we had L dot the rate of change of population. Here we're looking at the rate of change of capital, okay? Uh, and so it's just how mu however much you're pulling into investment uh, minus however much you're losing to depreciation. So you've got a bunch of factories and machines, you know, some fraction delta of them break down every year, uh, but then you're investing new money into new machines. And so in principle, you could be gaining capital, losing capital, or staying exactly the same as time goes on, all right? Uh, so that's, that's the basic idea. I mean, really, th this is kind of the most important equation in solo is just how does the capital stock evolve? Because capital is central to, to this model. It, 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 the, everything runs in capital. I mean, it runs in labor too, but labor is, is going to be, unlike Malthus, labor is going to be kind of just exogenous. Either it's going to be fixed or it's going to be growing at, say, you know, 2% a year, but it's just going to be kind of in the background um, growing along steadily, okay? Because that's base, we, but that's what we see. I mean, uh, population growth for us in the modern era is not hugely responsive to uh, output and stuff like that. I mean, it, we, it, it's a little, you know, it decreases with more output, but it's not hugely responsive. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's that's the basic idea. So, but let's make sure first we're clear on assumptions and also sort of the mechanics of, of how this kind of stuff works. Okay, so we're, we're in continuous time here, right? So time is flowing continuously, okay? So generally speaking, um, in the in any economic model that, or model of any sort that we're looking at, you, you can do a continuous time and think about derivatives. Okay, if time is continuous, you can think about a time derivative. Sometimes people do things in discrete time too, and that would be more like okay, you know, if you have capital and time t plus one, and that's going to be equal to capital and time t, you know, plus investment in time t minus you know depreciation. That's proportional. Okay, so that that it, I don't know if you've seen stuff like that, but this is uh, this is what it would look like in, in discrete time, okay, and and but for various reasons, it's easier to do things in continuous time, okay. Uh, it's just kind of cleaner, and, and you don't have to write as many subscripts, which is kind of annoying. So um, we're doing it in discrete time. So so but you can think about continuous time as sort of the limit, as that the the difference between t and t plus one 
if it goes from a year to a quarter to a week to a day to a second, it's just the continuous limit uh, of a discrete time process. Okay, now it's the same thing when you see the definition of a derivative. You know, f of x plus delta minus f of x over delta. You're taking that delta down to zero, and that's the you know sort of the continuous derivative and the limit. That's that's kind of what we're doing here because you know like from this equation you could say okay well k kt plus one minus kt is it minus delta kt. Okay, and then. I, I'm t skipping some steps here, but then you, you can kind of see how it just it would just converge. Okay, so <clears throat> right, so 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 that's one thing is just thinking about what is continuous time. Okay, and how how does it work? Uh, and so now let's think about these two terms: the 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 investment the positive investment force and the negative depreciation force. Okay, so with the positive investment, okay, force, like. If we just had investment and we didn't have depreciation for whatever reason, okay, it would be a pretty simple world. Like K is just, you just throw some investment there and it just sticks around forever. And K is just tracking how high you've piled up your investment. Okay, so how many factories do you have? So it's, it's pure accounting, right? I mean, this is all pure accounting, but it's really pure accounting. You're just integrating something up, okay? So that's, um, right, and so like literally K, would be like the integral from zero to infinity of i of t dt. Okay, if you if you if you integrate it, it would just be the integral. Okay. Um, okay. So and then we have that depreciation force, I guess. So if you imagine you just had with only depreciation. Okay. So k dot is minus delta k. All right. That that's what it would look like if you just didn't invest stuff. You just kind of ran out the clock on your existing capital stock. Um, we're kind of doing that sort of. I mean, we sometimes do that. We get a little lazy and just kind of write, write on what we had have uh, built up so far. Um, if that was the case, then actually that would also give you a relatively simple outcome because this is, you know, if, if you think about this this equation here, I mean, this is a, you know, if you've taken diff EQ, this is just a sort of the model of this simple linear homogeneous differential equation. Okay, or if you if you want to, you can move that k over and so the growth rate of k is just minus delta. Okay, so it's it's a k in this world k has a growth rate of minus delta. So it's just shrinking exponentially smaller. Okay? Um, and what we what we saw before is if 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 that's true, okay, then k of t is going to look like basically k zero times e to the minus delta t, right? So it's just that exponentially decaying process. Okay, that's what that's what constant depreciation looks like, all right? The deltas, we're assuming positive number, okay? Um, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I mean, and if you want to, since I had k zero over there, I mean, I guess technically you would also have to add in k zero here too. It's like k zero, whatever you started with plus the integral. Okay, so, um, but here you just have that de that the exponentially decaying capital stock. Okay, so every year ten percent breaks, and that's going to induce exponential decay. All right, so um, it's clear you, you kind of want both of these that, so that they can uh, balance off one another in some sort of equilibrium. Okay, but if you just had one or the other, you can see it's a simple outcome. Having both makes things a little bit more complicated, but you know we can we can certainly figure it out. Okay, um, and so that's. You know, and the, the, but the combination of those two forces is what we have embodied here in this this equation. Okay, so that's um, production investment. I mean, that's that's pretty much it. Okay, in terms of just sort of writing down mathematically what are our assumptions. Okay, um, but but it's good to sort of be clear on how you know sometimes you write stuff down mathematically and you sort of make assumptions even if you don't realize it necessarily okay so and i think that's true here i mean there's a couple of assumptions embedded in just just the way that i've written things okay so one is um let's see so uh i mean well we only have capital and labor those are the only two factors of production that's an assumption i mean there's other stuff there's human capital um there's public goods, there's uh, like public infrastructure, things like that. 
Um, sometimes you can embed that in Z and just say that's all part of whatever Z is, okay? Just this general technology thing, but other, other times you can't, okay? Um, you know, investment in consumption. So here we're saying, uh, first of all, you just, as a rule, invest, say, 25% of your output into capital. That's just what you do. Um, that's not that's, that's not really what we do. I mean, even at the aggregate level, investment rates vary over time. If, if we're, you know, if uh, we are very optimistic about the future, about technology, we might invest more. Okay, if the economy is not doing particularly well and we just need to get by, we might invest less. Okay, so uh, there's all sorts of reasons why you would invest more or less at, at the aggregate level. Okay, now if you think about, this is a macro, an aggregate macro model. So we're just like, we're treating the economy as just one number, basically, or a couple numbers. Okay, and really the economy is, is, comprises a bunch of you know constituent parts i.e people firms and everything like that okay um, and they're all making different decisions about how to invest or save depending on their own personal situations um, and those get aggregated you know we're thinking about the, the aggregate so, so there's also a lot of like microstructure that we're kind of ignoring okay um, and decisions that people are making that we're ignoring okay but so, so that's another assumption is the exogeneity of savings okay um, Okay, another big one is this is there's kind of two here relating to, to investment. Okay, so here we're assuming uh, a very sort of frictionless linear investment process. So you just like take one unit of output and that produces exactly one unit of uh, new capital, basically. Okay, so it, it might be that there's decreasing returns to scale, right? I mean, it might be that if you want to produce a ton of new capital in this period, in this year, eventually you're going to hit decreasing returns because you don't have, you know, the resources built up, you don't have the expertise, like, you know, you don't have the enough engineers to like supervise the construction of like 10,000 bridges, you know, every year or something like that. So we're assuming sort of this constant returns linear kind of thing. It might be that there's decreasing returns. Okay. And so you could, you could certainly do that if you want to make a more complex model and say like, you don't just make it one for one, there's another production function, blah, blah, blah. That would be complicated, but but it's important to keep in mind, okay? Um, and then I guess the other thing is that we're also assuming you just like, when you make new capital, it just kind of goes in and it is the same as old capital, okay? And, and that one is clearly not exactly true. I mean, like every year, okay, we have new types of capital. Like if you look at iPhones or, or various smartphones, things like that, uh, computers, um, but even, uh, you know, electrical power generation cars are getting more efficient every year, right? So uh, new capital generally is better than old capital. And so it's not clear you're just like Scrooge McDuck throwing your new coins down in your in your money pit uh, and, and, and just building up this huge mass of capital. I mean, it's, you know, you know, there's different types of capital, what we would call vintages, okay? Um, and like maybe the new types don't work well with the old type and stuff like that. So there's all sorts of complexities that might arise there, but we're just saying, okay, K dot, you know, I means more K dot, that's it, sorry. Okay, so it's another simplification. And it was actually like, this particular thing was like a huge deal. I think in the like 70s or something, this thing called the Cambridge Capital Controversy. Uh, somehow people got really heated about this particular debate vis-a-vis um, -vis sort of the, the how, how do you, especially in, once you start thinking, how are we actually gonna map this theory into the data? Then it's like, okay, well now we have to think about are we doing this right? Okay, so, um, yeah, that's yeah. Maybe maybe when we start talking about mapping into the data, we can talk more about that. But that's that's sort of big deal that's easy to overlook. I think uh, when you're just writing down a model like this. Okay, so those are yeah. I mean that that those are the sort of the main things I would say. Sort of stuff you want to be aware um, be aware of. Okay, and kind of be skeptical of even. Uh, but if you can take all of that, then let's let's uh, accept it for now and, and try and solve the model. Okay. Um, all right, so now the model, uh, it's actually not so bad, okay, um, to solve, all right? Uh, and it's gonna kind of just revolve around starting with this equation and, and substituting stuff in, okay? Um, now there's one question of what's going on with population, okay? Um, I think. So in the slides, what am I doing in the slides? I mean, we can start. 
we can start with with a setting with constant population. Maybe then we'll move on to to population growth. Okay, so. Um, Yeah. Okay. So, or well, let's do both. Okay. Let's do both because we've already done population growth in Malthus. So let's add in a third assumption. This isn't critical. Okay. Um, I guess I should like use actual words. Okay. So uh, population growth. Okay, is going to be constant at some rate n. Okay. So maybe n is two percent. There's just constant two percent population growth every year. Okay, you can think about it like a growth rate, or you can think about it like this sort of more like a differential equation sort of populate. The rate of change of population is some proportion n times the population itself. Okay, so each person, uh, you know, for each person, there's you know 1.02 people generated yearly. Okay, which is the same as uh, or 0.02 people generated yearly, which is the same as the two percent population growth. Okay, so um, all right, so that, let, let's let's do that and. and and then those are going to be our assumptions, okay? So, um, okay, so now how do we proceed? Okay, so we're going to start with that um, uh, solution. Okay, how do we solve this thing? Uh, so we're going to start with that equation, this equation up here, the rate of change of capital. Uh, let's, well, I'll start down here, okay? so. K dot is investment minus depreciation. Okay, so we knew that. Now we know what investment is. Okay, investment is uh, my cursor. Uh, is just some you know s times y. Okay, so we can plug that in. S times y minus delta k. All right. Uh, and we actually know what y is. We know what output is. Okay, and so then if we plug in for y with this. Uh, production function here, then we're going to get s times z k to the alpha l1 minus alpha and then minus delta times k. Alright, so that's you know, so that's k dot on the far left you can see k dot is equal to some function of k and l more or less. Okay, and then if we want to be complete we can write l dot is n times l. Okay, so at this point, you know, if you think about your state, what's your state at any given time? What do you kind of need to know? You basically need to know k and l, right? Um, if you know k and you know l, then you can calculate this whole equation, okay? Because s, let's call these parameters, you know, fixed constants s, z alpha, those are just sort of parameters of the model. They're not moving around yet over time. Okay, so so given that, you know, given k and l, we can calculate k dot. We can easily calculate l dot. Okay, and I guess I should include n here. We can easily calculate l dot, and so we can figure out where are k and l going. Okay, so we can, you know, we can say, okay, we know, we know k and l today. We know where they're going, and we can just kind of keep iterating on that. And so in principle, you know, if we had a computer to do this, we could, we could solve it. We can do this in Excel. We want to just have a new row for each time period, uh, and hopefully it would converge to something. Okay, so um, that's good. All right, uh, but we I mean, we can also do this analytically. Okay, we can also just do this with algebra and equations. Okay, so um, I need a new page here. So let's let's do that. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, summarize here. Okay, so. Basically, what, what we have so far is k dot is s z k to the alpha l to the one minus alpha minus delta k and l dot is simply l n times l. Okay, so that's where we're at. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So now uh, from here, you know, um, there's a couple different ways we could we could do this. Okay, so so one thing I think is useful is instead of thinking about things in terms of the rate of change necessarily, we can think about things in terms of growth rates, okay? And the way that we have assumed stuff and set things up is that it turns out that that's gonna be a good idea. Okay, so let's let's map this into like a proportional space. So instead of k dot, we're gonna to wanna to look at k dot over k, all right? Which is, you know, we can just, we just basically we're just dividing this, this left-hand equation here. Um, 
here by uh, by k. All right, so we're gonna get s z you know, k to the alpha minus one. Okay, that's where that we're gonna include that one over k there times all the one s alpha. Okay, and then minus uh, if we divide here delta k over k is just gonna give us delta. Okay, so the delta again just shows up as a constant. All right, so I guess. I thought that was going to be a fraction. It turned out not to be. All right, so that's what we have there. And then we, we can simplify that a little bit and say, okay, this is SZ. And then this is basically like L over K to the 1 minus alpha. Right? Because this, this is alpha minus 1, so that's like 1 over K to the 1 minus alpha. All right, and then minus delta. Okay, so that's, that's our growth rate for K. All right. And then, I mean, the other one is, is, is easy. It's, we just go back to kind of what we started with, which is L dot over L is equal to N. Okay. All right, so here, um, e even from at this point, okay, we're, we're going to simplify a little bit more, but at this point, we can try to intuit sort of the direction in which we're going to be going, okay, just kind of. To, to figure out if how things are going to be balanced out. Okay, so what's going on is there is continual population growth, all right, um, and there's also so the population is growing. We can invest in more capital. So in Malthus world, population growing, fixed capital, things kind of got crowded. Okay, in this case, as population grows, we can just make more and more capital to the kind of you know service or feed their you know employee or whatever that population okay and when we do that we also generate more output which makes us more able to generate more capital in the future okay so it's plausible to think that we can keep cranking up this machine to match the size of the population too okay um and and if that you know if that's the case and it is, it is going to be the case uh we would expect some balance or ratio to be to hold between population and the capital level Okay, so there'd be a certain amount of capital per worker, for instance, okay? Um, and you can see that here in this equation, all right? Uh, in um, essentially in, in this equation here, you can see like if, if we, if we wanna have some outcome where, where the growth rate of capital is constant, okay? Then, well, what would we need? So, so delta is, is a constant, okay? These things are constants, S, Z, alpha. The only thing we need to worry about is this, okay? So if, as long as this thing behaves, then we can get a constant growth rate of capital, okay? And and in particular, if this converges to a constant itself, L over K, if the ratio of L and K converges to some constant, right? So they remain in balance, then we can get a, a balanced outcome in terms of having like a, a particular growth rate of capital, okay? And, you know, if we want this ratio to be constant, and if we want these two things to be in balance, essentially they should be growing at the same rate, right? So we we kind of expect from these equations that we want to have that these two things are growing at the same rate. The capital, the growth rate of capital is equal to the growth rate of labor. We know that the growth rate of labor is n. Okay, so in fact we would want those both to be n. Okay, so essentially we're going to kind of keep keep our eye out for a solution in which capital is growing to match labor. Exactly. Okay. So now there's still the question of: Is there one factory per worker? Is there you know ten factories per worker, which would be kind of odd? Is there 0 0.1 factories per worker, which would be like ten workers per factory? Okay. So that the exact ratio is indeterminate at this point, and we can solve for that. But we would expect it to be some ratio, and it's not like it's going to be like you know capital keeps growing much faster than labor or vice versa. Okay. So there's going to be some balance. Okay, so that that's kind of what we're looking for. Um, <clears throat> okay, so you can there's kind of two routes. Okay, that you can take here. We can just sort of go the pure intuitive. Okay, well, you know this this equation here basically implies that capital and labor should grow at the same rate. Okay, right. So let's say like method one, the intuitive method. That would say, okay, well then that means that, you know, um, k dot over k equals L dot over L. 
all right which means that um equal to n right which means that we should have n being equal to uh this thing here n should be equal to k over k which we know is sz l over k it's alpha minus delta okay so it's just like you know you know given this equation and given that we sort of are, are we've intuitively de decided that these should be growth both growing at rate n then it's just like n is equal to sz and so on okay so that's cool because at that point we can just solve for we can solve for this thing right so so given this equation the only unknown is this ratio okay so we can you know let's move that delta over so we get delta plus n is equal to sz okay right um said right here uh yeah so we can divide i guess i mean uh we kind of want to cross multiply here okay so but uh i mean we can say okay well let's say delta plus n over sz is all over k to the one minus alpha okay so we're kind of combining terms there um and then uh the last thing we need to do is just sort of move move this exponent we want this exponent out we want i mean we want to move it to the other side okay so we'll move that to the other side instead of one minus alpha we're going to have one over one minus alpha okay and that's l over k okay so we basically have that ratio solved okay so i mean generally l over k is fine generally we we actually think about it as the inverse uh, k over l, all right. So, and that would you know, k over l then is just the inverse of that thing over there. So sc over delta plus n to the one over one minus alpha. Okay, so we we solve for l over k. We we actually went, kind of wanted to know k over l, so we just flip that equation around. All right. So, um, yeah, that's that's. I mean, that's pretty much it. So we we now kind of basically have the answer. Okay, so we know that they're going to be in some fixed ratio, k over l, all right? Um, and that ratio is sc over delta plus n bot. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, remember in the background, l population is growing exponentially, and we know exactly what l is doing, right? We know precisely at any given time what l is doing, and, and then, you know, l in particular is going to going to look like this um, you know so some exponential growth at rate n given some initial value l0 could be 1 could be anything um, okay so that's that we know that that's lt and then k is just going to be that l value whatever it is population value times this constant right because this means that you know, this means if we move L over uh, and, and are more explicit about the time, this means that K of T is L of T times SZ over delta plus N. So one over one minus alpha. Okay, so, and, and then we know, you know, this is L of T, it's just that exponential. Okay, so we know precisely in this model what, what K of T is gonna look like. Um, in the long run okay so this is this is only true kind of once every, all the, the so there's there's short-term stuff that happens but in the long run um this is going to be true all right so the the advantage of the intuitive approach is that well we kind of just sort of asserted that these two things are going to grow at the same rate and then we could solve for the ratio and then we could solve for what's sort of going to happen but it only really tells us what happens in the long run okay so that's useful okay to know um but but what it does tell us is what ha first what happens in the short run what happens if we th we're in some stable situation and something changes okay you know immediately what's the response okay so it doesn't tell us in a in a more intricate way what's happening but it will tell us in the long run where we're going to end up Okay, so that's a start. Um, 
but but we probably want to know more. Okay, but but already you can see some you know sort of regularities here. So you know, um, in particular, you know, often we ask the question of sort of what happens when we change parameters. Okay, so and it kind of makes sense. I mean, it's not that surprising. Like if you increase the investment rate s, okay, then you're going to get more capital. If you improve technology, you're going to get more capital because you have more output, which means you can make more capital and so on. Okay, so those kind of make sense. And then conversely, if you have uh, higher depreciation, you're going to have less capital. That also makes sense. Um, here, the population growth rate, it looks a lot like depreciation because we're dividing here, right? So it's, it's not like you have, like you kind of do have less capital, but it's just like because population is growing faster, it's harder for it to keep up with that, right? That's why it looks like a depreciation there. Okay, so, um, yeah. Sorry. Let's turn off my ringer. Um, yeah, so that's that's the idea there. Uh, sort of these sort of comparative statics roughly make sense, okay? But um, we, we actually kind of want to do know what, what are the precise dynamics, basically, okay? So, so that's why we're gonna, I guess approach number two, you know, kind of getting the dynamics. And this is going to be sort of the more formal approach. I guess we would call it formal, the formal approach. Um, okay, so there we're going to kind of go back. We just need to say, okay, where, where do we branch off? We're going to go back to kind of this growth rate equation for K up here. Um, you know, start from that and then and then kind of take a different tack. All right, so let's just copy that over down here. What do we have? It was L over K. Okay, so that was our that was our growth rate equation here, and then we also have that over L equals S. Okay, so this is this is where we were starting before, and now we're gonna take this more formal approach that's going to give us the, the precise dynamics. Okay, so um, when we do it this way, we can also draw pictures, which I think are useful, um, that, that are a little bit more illustrative of how everything works. Okay, so um, okay, so here we have these we have these two equations. Okay, and remember, and remember that state that I was calling it is k over l. That's sort of what you need to know, and that's what evolves over time this K over L state, all right? Now, as we saw before, kind of what's important is the ratio of these two things. It doesn't really matter if um, your population is a million or two million or a billion in this world. It, all that matters is sort of how much capital you have per person. Everything else kind of scales out, okay? Um, and so for that reason, we're gonna define this normalized quantity, okay? So we're gonna define uh, I'm gonna call it okay. So I'm gonna call it little k, lowercase k, and it's gonna be kind of looks like a regular k, except this, on the slides I'm gonna write it like that, so that the capital k, the lines don't intersect. The lowercase k they do intersect. Okay, so that's that's the basic idea. But it's you know lowercase k is gonna be capital divided by labor. It's the amount of capital per person. Okay, you know like when Malthus when you're doing before, we, we would talk about lowercase y, that's, you know, total output divided by L. So all, anytime I write a lowercase letter, by default, assume that it's a per capita uh, value, okay? All right, so that's, that's, okay, so that's what we're going to do. Now, um, that's, that's actually going to work out pretty well here, all right? It's going to work out pretty well because we can reformulate this model as a normalized model where we only care about kind of what's happening with lowercase k, all right? So the way we're gonna do, and, and already you can see, you know, this this here is, this is, well, this is L over k. This is like one over lowercase k, which is fine, all right? So like, basically, if we know lowercase k, we know how, we know this whole equation here, and this is just kind of, so we, we know how both of these are moving if we know lowercase k, all right? Now, what we want to come up with is just an equation that tells us how does lowercase k move around? How does the capital per worker move around? Okay? And so if we think about, well, what's the growth rate 
of lowercase k because these are turning into like alpha sums. What's the growth rate of lowercase k? Right. Um, given that it's defined as k over l, well, from those growth rate rules, remember the quotient rule in particular is just going to be the growth rate of aggregate capital K minus the growth rate of population. Okay, so that's it's just, it's just a quotient, and so we know how to calculate that growth rate. Okay, um, <clears throat> and then from here, it's just a matter of plugging things in, right? So we know from the left hand side of this uh, uh, slide here that this is that k dot over k is s z times l over k 1 minus alpha minus delta and then l dot over l is simply n okay this is k dot over k all right so that's that's good and then in fact we're almost there all right and then the next step is to just note that this here is just this is l over k is just 1 over k I mean, this is one over little k, right? So one over little k would be L over k, all right? So then we can write, you know, SZ, so right in here, one over k to one minus alpha minus delta minus n, so I'll just write that as minus delta plus n in parentheses, okay? So now, let's get over k, all right? So that's good, okay, I mean, we're pretty much there. I'm gonna simplify a little bit once more, but now we know, okay, given we know little k, oh, we have a chat. What do we got here? Okay, uh, is growth rate the same as the derivative? So in this case, so here, the, we go, oh, there we go. Yeah, so the derivative is, is the unnormalized growth rate. So the, you know, in this case, the derivative of little k you know, we just write it like that. Okay, and we're gonna find that in a second, actually. Um, the reason I the reason I started out with growth rates is that you you have you can with growth rates, the gro the the growth rate of this quotient is just the difference of the growth rates. Okay. With derivatives, you know, the derivative of k dot, um, I mean it's the derivative of k dot isn't some simple function of the derivatives of k and l. I mean it's relatively simple. It, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's relatively simple. Like if you just move this K, sorry, if you just move this K over here, you could write it like that. But it's, um, it's like, you know, like the derivative quotient rule is like low D high minus high D low over low squared. It's like that. It's not that simple. Whereas with growth rates, it's just the difference of the growth rates. Okay. So growth rates are cool because they, these quotient and product rules are a little bit simpler than like the derivative rules. Okay. And it's because they're normalized. All right. So, so in general, we're going to deal with growth rates, but we can then work backwards and get the derivative, and that's what we're going to do right now. Okay, so um, so yeah, so let's do that. Um, and essentially, if we want to get that derivative back, we're just going to move this k over here again. Okay, so you just take this and, and move it over there. Okay, so uh, but but first, it's probably just let's let's just rewrite this one more time. So here we have one over k raised to the one minus alpha. You could also write this as you know k to the alpha minus one, right? So this is this is k to the minus one to the one minus alpha, which is just k to the alpha minus one. Okay, so we're just combining those here like that. Okay, so that's our equation, and then the last step to get that growth rate is move this k over here. Okay, so then we're gonna get k dot is equal to s z. So now we have k to the alpha minus one times k, which is just k to the alpha, and then minus delta plus n times k. All right, so now, so like we start with the growth rate, but but actually it looks a little nicer when we write it in the derivative form. Okay, we just use the growth rate as sort of an intermediate step, uh, and we get this. Okay, so um, yeah, and, and uh, so this is interesting, I think, because it's it looks a lot like what we started with, okay, in the sense of you know, especially if you if you note that this z k to the alpha term is actually just little y, okay. So you can this is actually just s times y minus delta plus n 
times k, right? So it, it looks very much like that equation that we started with. Except for the, the only additional thing is this n that showed up, basically. Right, because remember the equation that we started with, like originally this, the sole assumption says k dot is i, which is s times y minus delta k, right? And now we have little k dot is s times little y minus delta plus n times k, all right? So really the only thing, like, if we just took this and made everything a lowercase, we'd almost be right. We would just be missing that n factor. And the, and the reason the n factor shows up is we're normalizing by population. And so like faster population growth, will other things being equal, oops, um, push down this, this per capita value here. Okay, so that's, that's the only reason that it shows up in that particular way, okay? Um, <clears throat> Okay, so that's that was a bit of work to do the, the intuitive method, okay? But we did get this thing, okay? So this tells us precisely how uh, that ratio, capital to, the capital to labor ratio is moving around over time, okay? Um, okay, and so we can, I'm gonna actually just erase this and repurpose this, okay? So, so now we can do a couple things, okay? So we, we can solve, the steady state of this model, okay? We can say, okay, well, after a while, eventually it's gonna converge to something, which would mean that k dot equals zero, okay? Um, and from here, if, you know, if k dot equals zero, that means that sz k to the alpha is equal to delta plus n times k, Right, and in fact, if you solve that for k, you get precisely what we had before, which is in this case s z over delta plus n to the one over one myself. Okay, there's a few steps in there, but you get the exact same answer that we got before. Of course, I mean, assuming we did it right, that's what we would expect. Okay, so that's that's good um, <clears throat> that we we kind of end up in the same place that we thought we would. All right, uh, but on top of that, we 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 can also talk about what happens in the, the short run, okay? And um, yeah, so, but but I guess, okay, so I'm almost out of time here. Um, but I guess, you know, one thing you can do is, I'm gonna like move over because I, I just don't wanna start a new page, is you can draw this graphically and you can say, okay, well, you know, there's a certain, let's say we have a certain level of K. All right, and remember the, the balance of forces here is investment, okay, which is like this portion here, uh, and depreciation, which is this guy over here on the right. All right, and so what do those look like? Okay, so the investment curve is, you know, it's some SZ constant times K to the alpha, and alpha is less than one because of decreasing returns. Okay, so it's just like some concave looking function like that, so that's, guy here investment okay uh, and then depreciation is just some constant delta plus n times k so that's just going to be like a straight line okay let's call that a straight line okay so then uh, that's depreciation and so well that's not a very good arrow but yeah that's depreciation there okay so we have these two forces investment kind of it has this decreasing returns, okay? So it doesn't last, it doesn't like scale up, whereas depreciation just scales up linearly. So eventually depreciation wins, okay? Because it's linear versus a concave function, okay? So eventually there's gonna be some intersection and that's exactly this, you know, like let's call this K star. That's exactly that that steady state that we found where these two, the, the forces of investment equal the forces of depreciation, okay? And on the left-hand side of that, you know, you can see that investment exceeds depreciation. And on the right-hand side, I mean, there's, there's less on the right-hand side, but here you can see that depreciation exceeds investment. So on the left-hand side, you're getting pushed higher because there's more investment than depreciation. On the right-hand side, you're getting pushed lower. So this is sort of that stable point that you're sort of destined to converge to eventually, okay? Technically, there's another steady state, 
which is exactly at zero. If you have zero capital, you can produce zero anything and you can't invest and you're just kind of stuck there. Okay, but if I gave you even a little bit of capital, then you could kind of bootstrap your way up to the new steady state. So this is like, this is unstable. This is, this one is stable. Okay, so that's the difference, okay? Um, we'll ignore zero, it's not, it's, because it's unstable, I think it's safe to ignore. Okay, so so that's the basic idea, and I'm out of time here, uh, of, of you know, how do you solve solo? How do you take a model in like aggregate terms when there's growth occurring underneath and normalize it to this per capita, this K over L notion, and then solve the dynamics of that, okay? Um, so, so that's useful, and that's going to be useful generally. You know, if we look at other models or variants of the solo model, we can use the same basic approach. Okay, with there's just like additional factors incorporated in. Okay, and then you know we'll we'll look at that later on.